All right, so in the spirit of being back on the horse for uh, doing video content again, uh, here is the second vlog uh, back in a while. Um, you can also see two interviews. I'm going to link uh, the interviews I did on other people's channels in the description below. If you want me on your channel for some reason, get your dose of uh, cynical, pessimistic negativity, then feel free to, uh, to hit me up. Uh, we'll work something out. And if you have like an anarchist project or something that uh, that you want uh, on my um, content, uh, feel free to uh, hit me up and I'll interview you about that too. Uh, also, I want to shout out uh, specifically because he uh, he threw some money at me recently. Uh, Nody Wolf uh, on on Twitter. He um, he threw some money at me recently for uh, f to support like you know, my ability to eat. I always appreciate it when people do that. And he didn't ask for this, but he has like a YouTube and a SoundCloud and shit. So I'll be linking those in the description as well. Uh, along with the uh, other interview that I did on this channel um, of the, the chick who runs the, uh, uh, the, the smoke shop, Kayla Higginbotham, if I remember correctly. I think I do. Um, but basically... Uh, this channel's back up and going, and in that spirit, I thought I would, uh, do the, uh, the unthinkable and, uh, and go back <laughs> to my bullshit of criticizing, uh, prominent governments. Uh, because basically, uh, I think there's a similarity here worth noting between, uh, the, the Saudi and Israeli conflicts, and there's a, a connection that just sort of poppled its way up uh, very recently. And that connection, I think, is a valuable one to bring up. So just to give you guys some, some background here, uh, Israel uh, gets a shit ton of support from the U.S. government. And one of the uh, primary ways that it gets support from the U.S. government is the war reserve stock. Now, for those of you who doesn't who don't know what the WRS is, um, it's pre-positioned stocks or a collection of war fighting material held in reserve, pre-positioned in pre-positioned storage, to be used if needed in wartime. They may be located strategically, depending on where it is believed they will be needed. In addition to military equipment, a war reserve stock may include raw materials that might become scarce during wartime. According to this definition, storage such as the Strategic Petroleum Reserve may be considered a war stock. So, um, why does that matter? Well, uh, it, the article on Wikipedia that I'm reading this from continues, the U.S. DOD maintains war reserve stocks around the world, mainly in NATO countries and in some major non-NATO allies. Uh, the U.S. 31st Munitions Squadron is tasked with maintaining and distributing the largest war reserve stockpiles of munitions for the U.S. Air Force in Europe. Conflicts of high intensity and lengthy uh, duration may have to rely mostly on supplies that are produced while they are ongoing. You know, forever wars. The kinds of forever wars the U.S. always gets involved in, but totally isn't the same thing in Ukraine. Um, and the First uh, and Second World Wars provide example of this. But smaller wars of shorter duration... By the way... Isn't it a great way to have a forever war that after World War II was over, they helped a bunch of Nazis escape, put some of them in charge of NATO, uh, put some of them in high-ranking positions in NASA. But it's just to stop them Russians. It's always Russia's fault. Russia did it. Um, so isn't it just odd from a forever war standpoint that the U.S., uh, who totally didn't like them Nazis and, you know, hates them some Nazis keeps on doing all these favors for Nazis. I wonder why. Shucks. It couldn't be a sympathy. It couldn't be an allyship. It couldn't be, you know, mutual, uh, you know, travelers. It, it has to be a coincidence. Just a massive fucking coincidence, you know? But uh, to, to get back to reading this, smaller wars of shorter duration where belligerents have already stockpiled sufficiently 
for the outbreak of conflict are able to rely on pre-existing stock. The U.S. invasion of Grenada or Pan Panama in 1989 in particular were small enough to be almost wholly reliant on existing stock. Now, we get to the juicy part of this article, which is the war reserve stock allies. Israel. Uh, also known as WRSAI, or uh, simply the acronym that I just said, was established in the 1990s and is maintained by the USEC, Euro European Command. It is one of the United States' biggest war reserves located within Israel. Initial initially, the WRSAI stock had $100 million worth of reserves. However, prior to the 2014 Gaza War, the WRSAI had nearly $1 billion billion dollars worth of reserves with an authorization to increase this to 1.2 billion in 2014 with the passing of the 2014 united states israel strategic partnership act the u.s agreed to increase its stock to 1.8 billion i wonder whose side the u.s is on the stock includes ammunition uh smart bombs missiles military vehicles, and a military hospital with 500 beds. These supplies are situated in six different locations throughout the country. When needed, Israel can request to access the WRSAI stock, but the request would need to be approved by the U.S. Congress. I'm going to repeat that. When needed, Israel can request access to the WRSAI stock, but the request would need to be approved by the Congress. Needed. Needed. They need it. It's, it's not a want. It's definitely a need. It's always a need. And that's why they've been expanding, you know, and basically decimating and destroying Palestine and why Palestine is basically non-existent now. Because they totally needed all those. All those. They needed them. So... During the 2014 Gaza War, the U.S. authorized Israel to access 120mm mortar rounds and the 40mm grenade launcher ammunition. These munitions were part of a set of older items in stock and were due to be replaced soon. Hey, yeah, you know, I see that you're, that you're not using these, these big-ass weapons that we could use to kill Palestinians. Uh, do you mind? Do you mind if we use these weapons in the 2014 Gaza war. You know, we need them. Um, and they also maintain their own war reserve stock in addition to the WRSAI that the U.S. stores there. With the, Within their war reserves, they keep ammunition, spare parts, replacement equipment needed for at least a month of intense combat. The majority of Israeli reserves are purchased from the U.S. due to the... It, their $3 billion in military aid from the U.S. that requires 75% of the money to be spent on equipment purchased from the U.S. So, that's another place where you can compare this to Ukraine. Because the uh, U.S. military industrial complex is the one getting things like the 54 billion they were talking about, and then the subsequent 40 billion they're throwing at it now, too. That's where it went. The primary place it went was to, you know, well, like, the proposition anyway was like, hey, we're going to throw this at U.S. weapons manufacturers, and then we'll send you what they make. The military-industrial complex gets to consistently enrich itself, consistently increase its uh, stocks, the S&P can be like, and like swiggling off to the bottom, but this stuff can just, because it's a war, and war is the health of the state. So basically, all of that is happening right now, right? And um, the like thing has been coming for a while, but like... Additionally, in August 2014, during Operation Protective Edge, the U.S. passed the Iron Dome Bill to allow $225 million in additional funding to allow Israel 
to increase their war reserves for the Iron Dome. So, like, basically, take what you need. We'll just give it to you. Um, and now, uh, af after, after all of that, there's this Intercept article that, 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 like, all these will be linked in the description. This Intercept article from May 19th that says... Israel used U.S. weapons to destroy U.S. assets and aid to projects in Gaza, or an aid projects in Gaza. D documents show that in 21, arms made and funded by the U.S. destroyed UNRWA schools, U.S. aid projects, and a Coca-Cola plant. They need them, though. They need them. If they didn't, ah, if they didn't have them, ah, shucks, man. That would be terrible. If the U.S. didn't constantly give them weapons. Uh, and enrich the domestic military industrial complex at the expense of the common person, plunging us deeper into debt for the blood of foreign countries. Yeah, darn, man, that would suck if they stopped doing that. <laughs> Last May, in an assault on the occupied, so this was like, uh, 2021 May, in an assault on the occupied Gaza Strip, Israel deployed hundreds of bombs missiles, and shells, killing over 240 Palestinians and wounding more than 1,900 others. More than half of the dead were civilians, according to the Israeli think tank uh, Mer Meir? Mer Meramit? I don't fucking care. Intelligence and Ter Terrorism Information Center, despite Israeli claims that it only targets combatants from Hamas and other Palestinian militant groups. At the end of the 11th day assault, tens of thousands of Gazans were displaced from damaged homes, already struggling in a region with 50% unemployment rate, toxic water, and crumbling infrastructure. Thousands of housing units, hundreds of schools, and 19 healthcare facilities were damaged. Compounding the devastating toll on Palestinian civilians, weapons made and funded by the U.S. were used to destroy American humanitarian projects and businesses, documents and reporting reviewed by The Intercept show. The destruction reached multiple hospitals and water treatment facilities supported by the U.S. Agency for International Development, that's USAID, uh, dozens of schools operated by the State Department-funded United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA, and a Coca-Cola plant built by a U.S. citizen. The Quote, The vast majority of ammunition used by Israel is manufactured or subsidized by the U.S., Rai Jarar, Advocacy Director at Democracy for the Arab World Now, or DAWN, told The Intercept, quote, It's fair to say that every Israeli munition is subsidized by the U.S. one way or another by U.S. tax dollars. So, that's a problem. Okay? It's a problem. Now, how does that connect to the story? Because y'all saw the title of the video, presumably. Um, well, in one of the, this is just me, I'm going to read from a post. Um, this is just one of the, like, this is one of the only groups, by the way, the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus is one of the only groups that, like, still allows me to speak. I have been, uh, suspended in multiple groups now, including, um, uh, Libertarian Party Discussion and Fakertarians for doing nothing wrong. Um, but generally just, yeah, they don't like me, so it's okay that uh, they can silence me. I, I, I'll, I'll take my, my toys and go to a better place that's like more libertarian. Um, and so I'm just going to read a post, uh, by, by Luke Enser, um, that, uh, that <laughs> goes into some of this stuff. Basically, um... The post Reno Reset LP is currently in its first major call to action initiative, namely having as many people as possible call Congress to co-sponsor and support War Powers Resolution HJ87, uh, that's HJ87, uh, to stop the U.S. backing the war in Yemen, which is arguably the greatest ongoing atrocity in the world. As per Scott Horton on the latest Part of the Problem episode, congressional staffers themselves are saying that not only does calling help, but it's needed. 
If enough constituents call, they will feel pressure to support it. Call 1833-STOP-WAR to be connected. You'll have to enter your zip code. For anyone unfamiliar, the Yemen war is a wholly unnecessary war against the already poorest country in the Middle East, which was started by Obama to placate the Saudis. Even summary details are, uh, are horrific. Likely millions dead from mass starvation, cholera outbreaks, mil- majority of kids with PTSD, and needing international aid. Oh, and the U.S. is fighting alongside al-Qaeda and started the war without knowing what victory would look like, let alone if it was possible. This is the worst of the worst U.S. imperialism, a de facto genocide against the worst-off country started to simply placate an ally with no known path to victory. War is the health of the state. Anti-imperialism is one of our core tenets, and this is a real chance to stop the worst example of it. So, why does that matter? Well, don't you know that... um, Israel uh, in January was revealed to want to give the U.S. a secret weapons wish list for use against Iran and Lebanon. U.S. based breaking defense, and by the way, uh, this is on uh, almayadeen.net. U.S. based breaking defense military news outlet reported on Friday that Israel m- military sources disclosed it has a list of weapons it plans to urge the U.S. to add to its American emergency stockpile in Israel as a safeguard for possible future wars in the region. Sources say the list of aircraft and bombs is required to take action against Iranian nuclear sites or to counter possible attacks from Hezbollah rockets from Lebanon. According to a U.S. Congressional Research Service reports, the War Reserve stock, uh, Allies stockpile established in the 80s allows the U.S. to... Well, we already went over that. Uh, in the 2020 CRS report, an Israeli commander is cited as saying, officially, all this equipment belongs to the U.S. military, end quote. Unless there is a conflict, then the Israeli occupation forces, quote, can ask permission to use some of it. Um, so why is this relevant? Uh, well, because... The, um, the, the stockpile has been growing for that purpose, and now the, uh, the, the great people over at Antiwar.com are reporting that Israel is going to ask Biden to okay giving Saudi Arabia laser air defense systems. So basically, anytime Israel wants to go against somebody, they just say, hey, Uncle Sam, gimme. And Uncle Sam's like, I can oblige. I can do that. And then they do that. And they're patsies to a war that is killing civilians and destroying property. Um, and all of this um, is, is, is corroborated here. According to a report from Israeli TV, Israel plans to ask President Biden to approve the delivery of a new laser-powered air defense system to Arab countries, including Saudi Arabia, as part of an effort to build an anti-Iran alliance in the region. Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz recently revealed that Israel was working on military cooperation with Arab countries in the region, the result of the U.S.-brokered Abraham Accords, which saw Israel normalize with the UAE and Bahrain. Saudi Arabia is hesitant to sign a normalization deal, but has quietly started uh, forging military ties with Israel. The report from Israel's Channel 12 said that Israel would like to deliver the laser system known as the Iron Beam to the UAE and likely to Saudi Arabia. So, that's there. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if people who are supporting, you know, Saudi Arabia on social media are getting censored. I mean, it's an invasion, right? I wonder if anybody cares about Syria, which U.S. is taking part in an occupation in, or Somalia, where they just redeployed. I wonder, I wonder if these countries are bad. You know? I mean, the U.S. can't even stop from poisoning its own civilians in places like Oahu or Flint, Michigan, or off the coast of Washington, even. They can't stop 
being unethical pieces of shit. So why not do it over there, too? You know? And why not back a genocide in Yemen? Why not back a genocide in Palestine? Why not have a color revolution that supports uh, C-14, right sector, patriot of Ukraine, Azov Battalion. Oh, but they removed the Black Sun and the Wolf Songle from their logo recently. That means they're not Nazis anymore. Despite the vast, like, amount of them who have, like, literal Nazi tattoos or just, like, wearing Totenkopf on the outside of their military uniform or, 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 or. Just a laundry list of fucking Nazis. And, you know, is it any wonder that they want to join NATO with, like, NATO's origin? Huh? Is it any wonder that the U.S. would back far-right militants just like they did the Mujahideen or, you know, the, the Contras or Pinochet or... It's almost like you can just say that communism, Russia, and then any sort of military industrialism will just get rubber stamped. Just like, hey, I want to do more war. Oh, man, you know, we just got through with, like, a ton of... We still got so many going... Oh, man... Have you, have you considered maybe giving peace a chance? Oh, um, Russia, communism, leftists, freedom, barbecues, fireworks. Fourth of July is coming up, guys. Isn't it great to be independent? Isn't it great? Isn't it great that this is the current way that the world order is established? You know, maybe like a new world order. Where, you know, a huge amount of people regularly die and then it's only if a certain group of people do it that they're the bad guys. But the U.S. totally isn't the bad guys. You know, the U.S., their allies, they're, they're not bad guys. They're just doing the same things that the bad guys are doing. But they're doing it for good reasons. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read from a thing here. Um... A tale of two wars, Yemen and Ukraine. When British Prime Minister Boris Johnson visited Saudi Arabia this week, the primary focus was an attempt to coax its crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman bin Abdiz Abdelaziz Al Saud, it's a really long fucking name, MBS, into pumping more oil to compensate for the loss of Russian oil on world markets. Critics asked whether it made sense to reduce dependence on one authoritarian ruler who was at war with his neighbor by increasing dependence on another authoritarian ruler at war with his neighbor. Damn it! They keep asking questions! They gotta stop asking questions! Certainly, just a few days after Saudi Arabia's biggest max, mass execution in years, and as the Saudi-led military intervention in Yemen nears its seventh anniversary, it's hard to swallow British rhetoric that the Gulf monarchies are a natural part of Britain's effort to build a network of liberty around the globe. Yet there are important differences between the Yemen and Ukraine wars that are ignored in commentary that smack of whataboutism. So this article continues to go on and, you know, play sort of middle groundy games that I don't particularly like. They say the Saudi-led military intervention in Yemen, which started in March 15, originally came at the official request of the internationally recognized government of Yemen, which had been formed as a part of a political transition away from the one-man rule of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. That government faced a coup by a combination of the Houthis, an Iran-backed militia and political movement, and Saleh, who wanted his power back. How do you like that it's that simple, according to these people? Either way, it says, moreover, the inter this intervention was broadly authorized by UN Security Council resolution, although it was not clear at the time that anyone foresaw this being an open-ended war that would last seven years and counting. However, the conduct of the war has involved many civilian deaths, and the UK in particular has tended to shield Saudi Arabia from the possibility of more critical resolutions of the Security Council. Even its concerns have grown about violations of international humanitarian law. 
Nonetheless, there are also some interesting political similarities. Saudi Arabia obviously wasn't just interested in reversing a coup for the sake of saving Yemen's political transition. In Egypt, by contrast, it had recently supported a coup against an elected government it didn't like. In 2013, against the Muslim Brotherhood. In Yemen, the Saudi concern was that the Houthis would take Yemen into Iran's geopolitical orbit. They cited fears the Houthis would become a new Hezbollah poised for attack across their borders. Essentially, they objected to Yemen changing its alignment from being an occasionally awkward neighbor to being aligned with their main rival, Iran. In geopolitical terms, this has some parallels with how Russia sees the prospect of Ukraine joining NATO as a means for its rival to gain influence directly on its borders. So, even when somebody tries to middle ground it, they still make a pretty good case for the corruption that's there. You know, I kind of just can't see it as not being corrupt. To me, it seems like Israel, uh, the Israeli government, is like, you know... We've been doing a little bit of this, uh, this, this, this genocide stuff for a bit now. Game recognize game. Help a brother out. We'll help you out. Want a want a laser uh, guided defense system, Saudi Arabia? It would be a shame if somebody was able to strike back. You know we can't have that. And um, you know, if we need to fight Iran, we might as well have you on our side, right? It's 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 not like these countries are fundamentally evil and unethical in their government status. Um, it's not like, you know, when you have this sort of relationship with the people around you, it's going to cause a significant amount of, you know, war. It's not like that at all. We've just got to keep on supporting the status quo, right? Oh, and by the way... Definitely choose to support Saudi Arabia um, and Biden's efforts to work with Saudi Arabia and, you know, Boris Johnson and all these other fucking leaders who are like, hey, damn it, we went against a really big fucking oil empire that we were relying on. Dang it, we need a new source. So let's go with Saudi Arabia. Because we hate fucking genocide and tyranny or something. That's why we went against Russia. And we'll just ignore what Saudi Arabia has been doing in Yemen. Also, the House of Saud is the richest royal family on the planet. And this is another example of state capitalism doing its thing, yo. You know? So, I just thought I'd bring all this up. Because I think it's valuable to bring it up. I think it's valuable to bring it up. Because when people aren't willing to look into any of this, and when they're not willing to connect some dots, yeah, that's a problem. Especially since a lot of people virtue signal about not supporting one thing. But like, if you don't support Russia because of, you know, tyranny and genocide, and you still support Biden who's supporting Saudi Arabia, a country guilty of tyranny and genocide imperialism, all that noise. And if you do all this while supporting NATO, the biggest empire right now, maybe you're a fucking hypocrite. Just something to consider. Anyway, um, I'm back. Content is back. And uh, if you appreciate uh, what I had to say today, feel free to support me. Uh, monetarily before I'm ultimately censored from all platforms as well. Because it's going to happen someday saying stuff like this. I, I, need to, I need to mind my P's and Q's and get back to work. I, I, can't, I can't get too... I can't get too uppity with the master. You know, the U.S. government, they got us on lock. We got to keep it going. We got to keep it going strong. And if we don't, we're traitors. Insurrectionists terrible anarchists we can't have that now can we this has been jeremiah harding smash the fucking state